And good evening. My name is John Leonard. I'm your host for the evening. I work for American Swimming Coaches Association. I would like to take just one moment before we introduce our guests, our special guests, and reflect for a moment on the importance of this evening. This is the third time we have held an Olympic head coaches reunion dinner. Each time we have a new member of the club, and it's a very small exclusive club, we hold a dinner. It's an important historic moment because the USA Olympic team is the most successful sports team on the planet. In 109 years, there has been one year, 1956, when another team earned the name of best swimming team on the planet 1956 in Australia. Congratulations to our Australian guests who are here tonight. <laughs> 108 out of 109 years is a pretty good record. I'm sure you'll all agree. The gentlemen who did that, who are with us tonight and who we have lost, are the key ingredients in making that great team record happen. Having an evening like this to recognize our past Olympic coaches, our, our present Olympic coaches, and everyone who has been in that unending chain of excellence is an important part of American swimming. Thank you all for being here to be a part of that. I have to tell you, and I think I probably don't have to tell you, that in an economic climate like this, this is an extremely difficult evening to put on. Without our main sponsor, USA Swimming, tonight would not exist. Thank you to Chuck Wilgus, who's sitting down here to my left. Chuck, would you stand for a second, please? In addition to about a million other things, Chuck is the most important guy in our country. Thank you, Chuck. USA sponsorship is much appreciated. The second piece of this is I have a gold pin on my right lapel here that says 50 years of swimming world. And our other great partner tonight, who has done all of the AV that you're going to see, and I think after you've seen it tonight, you'll understand why I am so appreciative of it. Swimming World and Swimming World TV, Brent Rudermiller, has done a fantastic job of helping us, and I thank them very much. Brent, thank you so much. So now, if we are ready, I would like to begin to introduce our head Olympic coaches that we are honoring this evening. Our first head Olympic coach, Stan Tinkham, with his wife, Carolyn Tinkham. Our second honoree, Coach Peter Daland. Our third honoree, hometown boy, hometown hero, Coach Jack Nelson and his wife, Cheryl. The man with the funniest story of the evening, Coach Don Gambrell. <laughs> Head national team coach and general manager, Coach Mark Schubert and his wife, Yoka. Coach Ed Reese and his wife, Eleanor. And last, the newest member of the very exclusive Head Olympic Coach Club, Coach Jack Bowerly and his wife, Frances Ruth. Coaches, Ladies and gentlemen, if I can ask you please to direct your attention to the screen. 
I, I fell into it strictly by accident. And, uh, I at that time was PFC and uh, I had just started swimming with the team for about a week and the commanding, the uh, commandant of the post, uh, he was a colonel, said, you're the new coach. And uh, it took me off the wards. I was carrying bedpans in the hospital and various other things as a private. And uh, so they transferred me to the pool where I was full time in uh, guarding and so forth. Could hardly wait to get up in the morning because it was going to be a morning workout and so exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, the year is 1956. Don Larson, pitching for the New York Yankees, throws the first perfect game in World Series history. Nikita Khrushchev, first secretary of the Communist Party, denounced the excesses of Joseph Stalin, and then Soviet troops invaded Hungary to put down the revolution against the puppet government. A young man by the name of Elvis Presley starred in his first movie, Love Me Tender. Pakistan became the first Islamic Republic, and God We Trust was made the national motto of the USA. The DNA molecule was first photographed. Play-Doh was introduced to the world of children. Many of us were those children. And The Wizard of Oz enjoyed its first viewing on television. And in our world of swimming, Stan Tinkham became head Olympic coach of USA Swimming. Talk about boy wonders. From 1954 to 1958, his team, Walter Reed Army Hospital, dominated the US Senior Nationals. He was 22 years of age when the string started. At 24, he was the head coach of the USA Olympic team to Melbourne, Australia. His personal swimmer, Shelly Mann, won the first Olympic butterfly medal. Stan also led our 1963 Pan American team. He then came home, built the Northern Virginia Aquatic Club into a powerhouse, and continued a long and storied career in both coaching and leadership of our national swimming associations. Selected to the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1989, please join me in welcoming head Olympic coach Stan Tinkham. Thank you very much. Thank you. In 1956, the Olympic Games were held in Melbourne, Australia. I was appointed by the Women's uh, Olympic Committee as the coach. What a thrill, the highest, what a thrill, the highest quality of swimming and the high energy and the excitement in the, in the team and the meet. We assembled uh, the team in Los Angeles, California, and worked out for several days. Some workouts were at the high school and some were at the Los Angeles Athletic Club with the courtesy of Peter Daland. We worked hard with much complaint and the swimmers, I considered their complaints as compliments, I, probably a little sadistic there. Uh, the Australians were strong in freestyle swimming and much publicized, although we swept the 100 butterfly, which was a new event and which we had been practicing really prior to it. We knew that it was going to be adopted, and uh, so we were practicing the butterfly sometime there. Uh, we tied for first in the 100 back in the meet, uh, and all uh, 10 judges, they had five judges on each side and timers, called it a tie, and uh, that sort of settled with me. We, we won the three-stroke individual medley relay. Uh, what three strokes do you say? Breaststroke and butterfly. It, it was started out, of course, as breaststroke, and then somebody read the rules and said you can recover over the water. And uh, as a result, the uh, butterfly was something you could swim in a breaststroke event. As a matter of fact, you could switch back and forth from breaststroke to butterfly. Uh, and then butterfly evolved as a separate stroke. This report would not be complete without my mentioning a, a chaperone for the Olympic Games in 1956. It was V. Toner from Pittsburgh. She worked very hard uh, with a couple of homesick swimmers and kept us straight as far as all of our supplies and everything else was concerned. She was a real jewel. Out of respect for V, the girls took her, all of her belongings and put them on the roof of a shed. And uh, it was really interesting. They had her toothbrush and everything right out on top of her dresser and it was really done well. And um, 
the, all the personal items on top of the uh, tool shed, as I said, the uh, details of a dresser, and uh, they all contributed to V. Uh, an American official, an American official team awakened her. He uh, accused her of being drunk as she was on top of the, uh, on top of the thing. And her retort was, uh, if I climbed up here, how could I have possibly been drunk? I was also um, a candidate for the American Pan Am Games and Women's, and that was really a great uh, process. As we swam in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in 1963, an incident which was uh, occurred, we worked out in the Olympic pool in the Olympic complex, and after practice, the girls wanted to uh, walk through the Olympic complex. The, there was one complex, and there were various wings going off, including the, uh, oh, the football fields and that type of thing. And the girls, of course, were impetuous. They wanted their pictures taken beside the burning flame. So they got up on the burning flame, uh, on the side of the burning flame, and had their pictures taken. The only problem was when half of them got off, the other half went down with the flame, and the flame rolled down the stadium. It, it, it just rolled down the stadium. It, it caught the seats on fire, and it was really a to-do. Um, they were taking pictures of each other, as I mentioned. The stadium um, fire was, uh, needless to say, I was embarrassed about it all. The officials came up, and they were really angry about it, I don't know why. But um, we volunteered, I volunteered to the team. I said, we've embarrassed ourselves, we've embarrassed you, we'll go home. And uh, the officials admitted the fact that it wasn't built very well, wasn't nailed together. And uh, they took the blame and apologized. The flame never went out as the bleachers were on fire. <laughs> and so the, the flame was preserved at that and uh, the flame lives on. In closing, I would like to uh, quote Sir Winston Churchill in one of his uh, speeches that he gave some, some time ago. And uh, it won't be too long for you. At any rate, he said a, a roughly a seven word speech. And that speech was never, never, never give up. Thank you. In 1960, the Olympics were in Rome, a fantastic Olympics. The head coach was Gus Steger. Gus had intended to be here with us tonight, but he has had some health, health issues that made him remain uh, home in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we hope he'll uh, be better shortly and be with us the next time we have one of these dinners. So uh, we appreciate everything Gus has done, and we wish him well and hope that uh, he recovers quickly. Well, I'd say try to be one step ahead of your athletes. And if you are, you can pretty well sell whatever you've got to sell. I'm not a person who regrets. Even when I wasn't being paid, I still enjoyed what I was doing. So I, I never have tried to look back and say, boy, that was a shame. Why did I do it? In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty. U.S. military forces attacked North Vietnam for the first time. The Warren Commission concludes that Oswald acted alone in the assassination of President Kennedy. The space probe Mariner 1 flies past Mars, sending home startling pictures of the surface, with the amazing sight of that guy with a beard and the John 316 sign clearly visible on the surface. The World's Fair is held in New York, and I had my first real date, taking Susan Ray to see the famous statue of the Pieta from the Vatican. A very highbrow date, and it didn't get me anywhere. <laughs> Last highbrow date I ever had. According to news reports, not a single juvenile crime is reported anywhere in New York City the night of the Beatles' first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. 
Many of us remember that. In our beloved sport of swimming, Peter Dalen became the head coach of the women's Olympic team. In 1964, Peter led the USA women's Olympic team that captured six of eight available gold medals. In 1972, Peter returned as head Olympic coach and his men's squad won nine gold medals. Peter's amazing career at the University of Southern California included nine NC2A men's championships and they were undefeated in dual meets in 20 of his 34 seasons at USC. Peter has been one of the most administratively active coaches in history, serving as chairman of swimming for the University of the Games since 1983, concluding that service in 2007. He has been president of the American Swimming Coaches Association, president of the World Swimming Coaches Association, and the first chairman of the FINO Coaches Commission appointed in the year 2000. He was selected to the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1977, and he's a recipient of the prestigious AAU Award, which was the precursor to the USA Swimming Award in 1975. Please welcome Head Olympic Coach, Coach Peter Dalen. It's fun to be back at ASCA, and I hope you're all enjoying it. <clears throat> what a voice, that's bad. Um, I should not have been the 64 women's elect Olympic co head coach, because another person was elected. But because she was on the selection committee, she said, I cannot take it, it's not correct. Mary Freeman Kelly, a longtime friend of mine, and I have to respect that kind of decision. I wonder how many other people would have done it that way. Anyway, I got the job. I'd never made a trip with the U.S. team. This was my first trip, and um, I won't say I was nervous, but I was very anxious to see that we did something. We had one interesting case. After the second day of training, one of the distance swimmers informed me that she didn't like the program I was giving her because there were two of us, Bob Busby, who handled all the short distance people, and I handled the 400 IM and the 400 free. They were the longest events then. So Bob, I said to Bob, you better take her over. And he did. And for about two weeks, she was happy in his program. Then she informed him that she really didn't like it. So Bob and I had a meeting, and I said, there are only two of us, and a manager, and, and chaperone, and I don't think it's fair to ask her suddenly to take this over. She was about a 65-year-old lady, and a very nice woman. So I said, I think something may happen when we get to Tokyo. Well, when we got there, I ran into the girl's mother. And I said to her, I think I can get you in the practice pool. I think it would be important for your daughter's success for you to work with her. And she, said, she was very surprised. And uh, this, this was the only thing I could come up with. We were out of coaches. Neither of us qualified, and so the mother took over. And you know, it's amazing. The girl got better. <laughs> so if you're strutting around thinking you're the living end in coaching, go through one of that, those experiences. And she's, she got a medal. And the end of that story is that I ran into her years later in Seattle, Washington. She's a very charming lady, and she was happy when she thought about the 64 Olympics. So sometimes we have to do unusual things in life. 60 or 72 men. Uh, we had one super swimmer and a very good team. And we, we had a training camp at West Point, which was perfect. And the boys said, are we going to New York? I said, absolutely. 
So they assume we're going to nightclubs and really have a ball. Well, we went at nine o'clock in the morning and came back at three in the afternoon. <laughs> and it was a really good team and I enjoyed working with them. And we decided we were going to win 10 of the 15 events. By the way, in the, in the girls, we'd won uh, six out of eight. We only lost two, and now we're slowing it down a little bit because you have to work with the material that's presented to you. <laughs> and we got over there, and uh, everything went smoothly. Uh, we won the 400, and we won this, and we won that, and Spitz was not too bad. <laughs> he did say to me, two days before the meet started, you know what's the matter with me? Well, I thought of a few things. <laughs> and uh, I knew Mark, because I, I was a friend of George Haynes' coach, and I knew his parents and a uh, lovely mother. And <laughs> you're trying to judge by omission. That's a dangerous game. And then um, Mark told me, the problem is I don't have any speed. And here's the guy who's going to win the 100 and win the 100 fly, and he tells me two days before the meet he has no speed. So I concocted a little set and uh, descending, lots of rest. And of course, he excelled. And then I tried not to look at him. He jumped out of the water next to me, and I said, oh, Mark, you're here. How'd you do? And I had watched it, so I knew. And he said, I'm fine. And Turned out he was rather good, wasn't he? <laughs> but the real climax came right before the 100 free. And we walked over to the pool together, just happened to, and he was a nice guy to talk to. And he said to me, Coach Dayland, I do not want to swim the final of the 100 free. So I thought for a second, and then I said, you don't have to. It's an individual championship. There is no team score in this meet. It's an individual championship, and if you don't want to swim it, you don't have to. However, <laughs> if I had been like you and gone the half mile walk from the uh, housing to the pool twice yesterday, round trips, and once one way tonight, I think I'd swim it. Well, he thought for a second, and he said, yes, I will. <laughs> and what the problem was that Michael Wendon, the defending champion of the 100 from Australia, who had swum brilliant hundreds in the preceding games, and Spitz was on our team then. He saw Wendon win. He saw what a tough turkey Wendon is when he gets in the big race. And he had drawn Wendon in both the heat and the semi. And both times, Michael had buried him. So that was his reason. I knew it. I didn't ever refer to it at all. And I just stood there and I said, well, it's been a long hike over here. Are you tired? Yeah, I'm a little bit. And you've done it two round trips in one single way. That's a lot of walking. If I had done that much walking, I think I'd swim it. <laughs> Silence. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> then the final came, and this Mr. Insecurity was standing on the blocks, <laughs> and I don't know if Wendon was next to him, it didn't matter, because Spitz took off, broke the world record, won the event by half a body length over Jerry Heidenreich's teammate, and Wendon finished fifth. Thank you very much. <laughs> One thing that, that stands out uh, in my mind is that we had a chance to win that 4x100 freestyle relay, provided every one of our girls would do all their best times. What was so outstanding was they won with their minds. They didn't worry about uh, 
you know, the East Germans at this point. They were worried about America winning, and they did, and people went bonkers. And, and the thing about it is uh, they, they were truly, truly great Americans during that, during that relay, and, and they had no fear, no fear at that point. They, they, those four girls, Kim, Wendy, Jill, and Shirley, they broke the world record by four seconds. But a number of the coaches would look away when they saw me. They would look away because they themselves did not understand what these girls had achieved. They themselves didn't recognize the fact that we had been cheated to the limit. In 1976, a travel event occurs because the French airplane, the Concorde, enters service for the first time, cuts flying time across the Atlantic to three and a half hours, an amazing thing. The first USA $2 bill is issued. I've got two in my wallet today, not from 1976, I might add. Landing vehicles from the USA space program sets down on Mars. Jimmy Carter defeats Gerald Ford in the US presidential election. A movie called One Flew Over the, Over the Cuckoo's Nest wins the Academy Award for Best Picture. The first ever punk rock single is released, New Rose by the Damned. 32 African nations boycott the Montreal Olympics in protest of continued sporting links between New Zealand and South Africa. And in our beloved sport of swimming, Jack Nelson becomes the head coach of women for the 1976 USA Olympic team. Access to success is through the mind. Resided on the back of Fort Lauderdale Swim Team t-shirts for decades. And no one personified this thought more thoroughly than Coach Jack Nelson. He has the special skill to make each person he speaks with feel unique, important, and a crucial part of the team. Jack's one of the most successful high school swimming coaches in history, as well as coaching USA national teams in 74, 75, 76, 79, 81, 83, 90, and 1994. He's a member of five distinct swimming halls of fame. Coach Nelson's FLST team won seven national championship titles, as well as eight US Open titles. In 1976, against an East German women's team that was later proved to be composed entirely of doped athletes, Coach Nelson's motivational skills were vital to keeping that team together and leading to their ultimate success on the final day. Selected to the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1994, please welcome our hometown hero, the inimitable Coach Jack Nelson. Is everybody having fun? Well, let me hear you, babies. John said I had to come in here and um, tell you folks one of the greatest moments in coaching. And I wonder what he meant. So anyway, it was July 25, 1976, in Montreal, Canada. Frank Elm, Jim Montrella, and I had been honored to be selected the coaches for the United States Women's Olympic Team. We trained at West Point and had a great togetherness there, then went up to Montreal by bus. The East German women were taken center stage in the world swimming by breaking world records at Belgrade, wearing a new breakthrough suit. Uh, our women were very aware of the East Germans, they and we had arrived in Montreal simultaneously. Their deep voices were a shock to all of us. Joe Hoshberger came running from the ladies' locker room saying, Coach, there are men in the ladies' bathroom. <laughs> and I said, Honey, it's just the, 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 uh, the, lady, coach, the lady swimmers from uh, Germany. So once the Olympics began, our women were breaking American records and doing best times for themselves, but coming in second and third to the East Germans. Now we know, after the fact, that
that they had been taking steroids to enhance their performances. We suspected because of their massive bodies and male sounding uh, voices, the press would ask questions like, Shirley, how does it feel to be second in your event? I did not have good thoughts toward the US press during that meet because they didn't mention steroids. They only mentioned that Shirley wasn't winning all the races. Well, in truth, she did win all the races, but she never got credit for it. <laughs> the women's 400 freestyle relay was the last swimming event of the Olympics that year. Just prior to the relay event, while walking down the deck, one of the Canadian coaches said, good luck uh, for our relay is going to be second. And I said, oh, congratulations. And I turned around and said, but we're going to be first. And I didn't want to tell him that because I didn't want to fire him up. But anyway, I'll tell you, I'll tell you more later. Um, the women's 400 freestyle relay was the last swimming event of the Olympics last year. Just prior to the relay event, well, oh, okay, I did that, didn't I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good idea that the Germans were going to lead off with Cornelia Ender, who held the world record in the 100 meters freestyle. Each of our ladies had their individual specific responsibility in this relay. We practiced relay takeoffs every day, and all the swimmers and coaches on the staff agreed on the order that we would swim to kick the Germans' butts. We let off our fastest swimmer, Kim Payton, our national champion, and her job was to stay within a body length of Cornelia. Isn't that fantastic that a young lady can accept that job knowing that, that she's going after the world record guy in the first place? But anyway, Kim Payton, our national champion, her job is to stay within a body length of Cornelia. She did that and broke the American record as well. Wendy Bolio, who had won the bronze medal in the 100 butterfly between two steroid-enhanced East Germans, was next. Her job was to come up even with the German team in lane four. She did her job beautifully. Jill Sterkel, the youngest on our women's team, went third. Her job was to get Shirley a lead, and Jill was absolute dynamite in doing so. Shirley was a fighter, and as she dived in, she had a very slight lead against the East German team. And she kept the lead to get the first gold medal for our USA women in the 1976 Olympics. Our, lead, our ladies each had a, a, a let me start over here. Our ladies each did what they needed to do, and we won the event, and it was very, very exciting. We went 344.82. Uh, each of our girls went seconds faster. We had an American record 56. We had a 55. We had a 55 and a 56 anchor. And of course, the anchor lady was a, a, a distant swimmer. <laughs> the, uh, let's see. Donna De Verona and Jim McKay were the newscasters for the swimming events. They had predicted that the German women would win the event. Donna, who Cheryl and I love, said after the event, I have never been happier to eat my words. My wife was sitting in the stands with a singer by the name of Andy, what's the last name? William. Andy Williams, okay. And she kept hitting him on the shoulder. I didn't see this. I heard it from other people. Said, he did it. He did it. He did it. He did it. And this guy didn't know who in the hell he did it is. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we, uh, now, now I want everybody who hasn't seen it and who have seen it to watch the record-breaking women's 400 freestyle relay right now. Now keep in mind, Kim Payton, Sprint Freestyler. Wendy Bolio, Great Butterflyer. Jill Sterkel, Sprint Freestyle. And Shirley Babishop was the distance uh, anchor. The one, the one great thing, 
that all four girls had what they had was the hunger and the greatest of mind. Here are the uh, lane lineups for tonight. In lane one will be Sweden, the Soviet Union in lane two. The United States will be swimming in lane three, right next to the East Germans in lane four. Canada is in lane five. The Netherlands in lane six. France in lane seven. West Germany in lane eight. 1952 was the last time we didn't win a gold. And there's Cornelia Ender there, thinking about the race, the leadoff swimmer. It's nice and it's best to get a lead and a relay because you've got clear water and... Some of their young swimmers are only 15, 16 and they'll be in Moscow in 1980. And Shirley Babishoff now, the United States relay team, will be in lane three. There's Cornelia Ender up in lane four to lead off for the East Germans to hold the world record. They'll be favored in this event. The United States has an outside chance for the goal in Canada. 11 events. They've only lost one, just like our men. There's the USTA team. Shirley Babishoff in the middle. She is going and to anchor the team. Kim Payton will lead. Wendy Bolio will swim the second hundred meters. Jill Sturkel the third hundred meters. And the anchor woman will be Shirley Babishoff. First holds the world record 55.65. There they go, and in there with that great start of hers, jumps right out in lane four. United States, second, right now in lane three. You sure no one's pleased that they're, they're looking at her feet as the expression goes. Wendy Bolio. Wendy Bolio is one of the three American women to win medals here. Uh, for individual events, Wendy Bolio was third in the 100 fly. All right, Ender gave them a length lead. East Germany's in the lead. United States is second. And uh, third right now in lane two is the Soviet Union. Swimming for East Germany now in lane four is Petra Primer. There's a world record of 56.59. Let's Joe Sturkel getting up, ready to go into the third 100 meter. And uh, picking up some time here, Wendy Bolio has picked up on the United States second in the four-time 100 women freestyle relay. East Germany touches and off they go. They're in the lead and these are second. The United States is second. And running here is Jill Sturkel. They're up with them. And they don't have Ender in the final leg. Babishoff is already the first. Bolio with a Look at this. He's down in the lead. Here's an upset right now the way it's going. Jill Sturkel has taken the lead. Here's Shirley Babishoff. She'll swim anchor. And this women four times 100 meter relay. Shirley Babishoff, let's look at the world record split, world record 352, we're oh, in 48. Hey. Fabulous split. She's swimming against Claudia Hampton. Hampton with six in the 100, Babishoff with fifth. It's all on her back. The whole team has been depending on Shirley Babishoff this entire Olympics. Shirley Babishoff has never won a gold medal. Shirley Babishoff in lane three. The East German Claudia Hempel in lane four. They're going to battle for the gold medal in the four times 100 women's freestyle relay. On the third, Babishoff's in the lead. But she's being contested very closely by Claudia Hempel. Babishoff in the lead. Lane three, Hempel's coming on. Hempel coming on now, Babishoff spurts out. United States in the lead for the gold in the four times 100 meter freestyle relay. Curly Babishoff stays in front. Here's the drive to the finish. Babishoff hanging on, hanging on, going for the wall. And Babishoff is the winner. The United States has upset East Germany in the four times 100 meter freestyle relay. And Curly Babishoff has finally acquired her first gold medal. And what a job she's done here for the United States. A world record 344-82 is their time. The world record held by the East German team is 348-80. They're a happy bunch. Savasov split with 55-28 after the 800 meter freestyle. And the crowd on its feet. It's been one of the outstanding events. If I were to say the one thing that I, as I look back on my career, that's the most important I think it's it's getting people to aim high enough. Everything needs to be goal oriented. I've, I've always been very goal oriented myself, and always felt that that was a way to to 
to best motivate swimmers was through goal orientation. But uh, different ones are completely different as far as, far as some are more farsighted and, and can look out and think, you know, maybe Olympics. Others are uh, looking out, you know, trying to make a standard. So you have to try to identify and help each one identify their goal. And I think it's, it's getting people to aim high enough. Don Gambrell. Well, first of all, I want to explain my attire. <laughs> I'd like to blame it on my wife, and she will be waiting for me to do that when I get home, but I won't. It was my fault. It was hanging in the closet. I got the jacket. I got the shirt, but I left the pants there. And I, <laughs> I found that out about 10 or 15 after 5. I was supposed to be down here at 5.45. So anyway, now you wonder what type of guy you had in charge of your Olympic team. Now you know. <laughs> We had uh, some, some things to overcome with the team in 1984. First of all, uh, the boycott in 1980. We had several swimmers that made that team that had made the team in 1980 and were denied the chance to swim. Uh, we had others, unfortunately, that didn't make the team again. And uh, so it was, a, it was a team that was put together of people that were feeling really bad for their comrades that hadn't made it, and others, of course, that were very excited for making it. The next thing was, this is the first time we, had, we were actually going to have a combined team in 1980 when we didn't compete. In 1984, it's the first time we'd combined men's and women. And uh, that, that really put a lot of great coaches on the staff. Except if you're the head coach and you're looking at the other seven coaches who are also head coaches, that have been your contemporaries and rivals for all these years, then there's a, a, a little bit of wondering what's going to happen when we all get in the same room. Um, we conceived an idea to, to go to Hawaii and take 80-some athletes, ones that we felt had the best chance to make the Olympic team. And so we went over for a week at Thanksgiving and took the coaching staff over there and began to try to mesh as, as a coaching staff. Uh, it worked out for the most part, and by the time we got to L.A., we also had two other coaches that were added for, uh, for the training camp because of the number of athletes that they had on the team. Uh, we trained in Mission Viejo, and uh, it was a, a very good training camp and a very good place to train. <clears throat> I want to tell you about something that was an event aside from the Olympics that I felt really could have had tremendous uh, repercussion for our team. We went to uh, dinner downtown in Los Angeles with the entire team. This makes an entourage of pretty close to 70 by the time we had, I think, as I recall, 53 athletes, plus the coaches and managers and trainers and everybody that went along with us. Well, we were invited back to Dara Torres' house for a little uh, luncheon after uh, mid-afternoon get-together at her house in Beverly Hills, just down the street from the Beverly Hilton, a very, very nice house. And in the backyard, tennis court, 25-yard swimming pool, basketball court on about a three or four car garage and uh, we've got a lot of athletes hanging around and guys like to show off a little bit sometimes so first thing I have a big tennis match with Steve Lindquist and somebody out here in tennis court I'm worried about a sprained ankle uh, nobody got in the pool uh, <laughs> over on the basketball court I look out here and here's our entire freestyle relay Rowdy Gaines, Tom Jager, the whole, the whole group playing basketball and I'm worried about sprained ankles and broken legs. And, and uh, so I look over and there's about two or three of the alternates that are sitting there watching the game. <laughs> and uh, there were also two, two of the alternates playing. And I think, well, uh, okay. You don't go up to Tom Jacob and say, Tom, I don't want you to play more basketball because you might get hurt. That, that doesn't work. Now when they're 23 years old, 24 year old men that really think they, and maybe do more, much more than a coach. And uh, so I talked, to, I called the two that were on the, that were gonna swim in the morning on the way, the two alternates. And I called them over and I said, I want you guys to sit down. You're not playing any more basketball. They said, what do you mean we can't play more basketball? I said, well, somebody's gonna get hurt and when they do, I have to have you available to, to swim in the relay. <laughs> they put the ball up and sit down. So that really was a way of handling a situation which could have been explosive. 
Uh, I also have a relay that we're not going to show because it takes eight minutes. And I was told we only had eight minutes. It didn't take quite eight minutes, which so I'm a little faster than that. But it was the 800 free relay. It was very much reminiscent of what you've just seen. We had uh, four athletes on that team that were selected <coughs> to be on the relay, and we knew who the, the relay was going to be. And when we had the trials, after the trials at night, I, I went up to Bruce Hayes and told him, I said, Bruce, you're going to anchor the relay in L.A., so I want you to, you know, begin thinking about that and getting yourself ready. I'd seen his college coach put him on anchor laps before. Uh, he wasn't the fastest guy, but he always swam negative split, so I'm very, very good control. And he says, why me? And I said, well, because I know that they're, they're going to have Michael Gross anchoring, and hopefully we can get you in position where he'll overswim. So we conceived that idea right from the first and went to training camp and, and lived with that idea. Uh, there was a little discourse at times between others on the staff that thought maybe we shouldn't do that, we should do something else, but um, we made the decision that that's the way we would do it. So we get ready to, to swim the race and, and we lead off with uh, Heath, who had just the night before been second to Mikhail Gross in the 200 free when Mikhail broke the world record, and we led him off. And uh, as the Germans lined up, we could see that Mikhail was going to anchor. Then next, we had Dan Larson. Dan was, I believe, 25, 26 years old, the most experienced swimmer that we had on the team. So I felt quite confident that he'd be able to maintain a lead and hopefully extend that lead. Uh, next, we had um, Jeff Float. And Jeff had, had, got, had placed fourth the night before in the 200 free and had a lot of experience as well and was one of the team captains. So we wanted him in third place and then anchoring with Bruce Hayes. Uh, the relay, and I'm sure many of you probably do remember it, and it was the closest relay race in, and still even closer than 100 was this time as far as measured time. But we led off and, and Michael got us a good lead. And then the two guys that I have a lot of confidence, they were great experience and, and know just how to swim this race, go. Dan went out faster than he's probably ever gone out in the, in the 200 in his life. And he has over a body length, has gained over a body length. We're almost two body lengths ahead by the time he gets to 50, back to 75, and we're still holding the, most of that lead. And then all of a sudden, he begins to crumble. And the lead closes up to less than a body length. Well, Jeff Float takes off, same thing again. He extends over a body, body length and a half lead into the wall, comes off. And 75, once again, over swam. And if you've had swimmers that uh, butterfly, sometimes they can't even get their arms out of the water hardly. And, and he had, had really a tough time getting the finish. And then Bruce Hayes left. Mikhail Gross at that point only had a body length to make up. And he was six foot eight, and he said his wingspan was eight foot. And uh, he almost made that up on the start. By the first 50, he was dead on even with him. And you see Bruce in the film going with his two-beat kick. He'd flutter a little bit in and out of the wall, two-beat kick, stayed all the way through the 100, back about halfway back towards 150, and then began to put his legs in. They hit the last wall just even, and Bruce being, they, the battle then became very strategic as far as trying to get to the wall and who was going to get there. And uh, I know the coaches that you work with your swimmers on discipline all the time on finishing and concentrating to finish and touching the wall. And uh, if you look at the film, as I've looked at it many times, as, as you look at that film as they come to the, the last five meters, they're so dead even that you can't tell who's going to be there first. And halfway between the, the rope, or excuse me, the backstroke flags and the wall, Mikhail Gross takes a breath. And I really feel that that four hundredths of a second probably was, was in that particular stroke. So we did win the race, and it was, it was exciting. Uh, they had a lot of, I guess, probably 10,000 fans in temporary bleachers that I'm sure that the safety people were concerned that the bleachers might not last through the, the enthrall that came from the crowd. But it was a very, very exciting thing. And uh, I went to the press conference. Uh, most of the time, I hadn't been able to do that. And this was the last event of the day, and, and I didn't have anybody else to talk to for the next race. So uh, I, after recovering from the race, and by the way, I'd had a five-way bypass some nine months before that time, and uh, I was sitting down recuperating after the race. 
uh, went to the to the press room and they're talking everybody's talking and Jeff Float has a hearing impairment and uh, has really doesn't hear well and and with his hearing aids out I'm sure he has almost no no hearing ability and they asked him what he what he felt and he said well the only thing I can say is the noise of the crowd was deafening <laughs> thank you very much In 1988, Richard Quick became the head coach for men and women for the USA and the Olympic Games in Seoul, Korea. A year ago around this time, I sent a letter to all the gentlemen at the table, inviting them and telling them that this reunion was going to occur since we had a new member of the club and asking for their participation. Predictably, the first response I got was a very enthusiastic phone call from my friend Richard Quick saying, yes, I'll be there. That was typical. Richard cherished anything that had to do with the red, white, and blue. It would leave us incomplete without hearing from Richard tonight. Well, I think swimming is just a fabulous sport. Um, you know, there's so many values to it. No one tells you that you have to sit on the bench. You, if you swim fast enough and you improve, you're going to get in the game. Nobody makes a judgment on that. And, and so I think it's a wonderful sport in that respect. It's, it's up to you. What you put into it, you can get out of this sport. Um, I have been blessed and honored to be a part of six United States Olympic teams. And, and uh, they are all special opportunities in life. But it's difficult to... Uh, uh, you know, uh, qualify Olympic thrills because anytime you have the honor of representing the United States in international competition and helping an athlete compete at that level, it's a tremendous uh, experience. I've worked with so many great athletes that have represented the United States so well in the Olympic Games and just done some great, great things. And it's, it's just an honor to be associated with those people uh, that have competed at the highest level and, uh, and put their, what was good for their team and their country, even above their own individual efforts, has, has been just a thrill. I, I've always had a firm belief system that this sport is all for the athlete. So it ought to be uh, athlete driven, it ought to be, the governance of the sport ought to be centered on what is best for the athlete first and foremost. And um, I, mean, I would even suggest we start every meeting by saying, is this the very best thing for the athlete? And then at the end of the meeting, you evaluate the value of the meeting, the success of the meeting, based on did you meet the goal? Is this the best thing for the athlete? And uh, if we keep that in mind, then our sport's gonna be healthy for a very long time. You know, most people sell themselves a little bit short of their full potential. And I really believe that the major role of the coach is to expand the vision of possibility uh, for an athlete with regard to athletic accomplishment and with regard to the role that striving for high-level athletic accomplishment can play in their lives later on. The role of the administration in the governance of our sport is to not get too bogged down in the governance of the sport and to remember that this sport is about young people and their dreams as athletes and to try and to continue to try to grow that dream into the future of their lives where, in my opinion, the value of sport really comes out. My advice to a young coach is to be coaching for the right reason. And that means that you want to coach the athletes that you're involved with so that they are having a wonderful experience, so they are growing as human beings during the process of being coached by you as a coach, and that um, you are growing young people for the future and, uh, and, and helping them 
mature as individuals, and using sport is the vehicle to do that. I'd like to be remembered for the fact that athletes had a great experience um, working with us, striving for high-level goals, and during that process, they're learning about themselves, learning about how the world functions that can help them be more productive, help them be uh, better citizens, better uh, husbands and wives and fathers and, and, and uh, mothers and, and that kind of thing so that the world is a better place because they participated in swimming and had a great experience doing it. Richard was selected to the International Swimming Hall of Fame in the year 2000, also won the USA Swimming Award in 1988. Rest in peace, Richard. You're in our hearts, you're in our minds forever. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Can I ask everybody to just stand up for a second and rise, if you would? Join me in a moment of silence to remember our recently fallen friend. Thank you. You know, I, I've never really set one of my goals to be the Olympic coach. I, my goals have been more set as far as helping the athletes to do well, helping the athletes to make the Olympic team. And I think, you know, if you set a goal to help your athletes to make the Olympic team and succeed at the Olympic Games, uh, and you, you have the ability to coach uh, other people's swimmers because an Olympic coach, one of the important aspects is the ability not just to coach your own swimmers but to coach other people's swimmers, then I think that's an, an honor that will follow. In 1992, Presidents Bush and Yeltsin declare an official end to the Cold War. Violence erupts in Los Angeles as four police officers are accused of beating a Mr. Rodney King. Demo the Democratic Convention nominates Bill Clinton and Al Gore. Clinton is elected president over incumbent George Bush. CDs surpass cassette tapes as the preferred music medium for the first time. Johnny Carson hosts The Tonight Show for the last time. U.S. Armed Forces are asked by the U.N. to safeguard relief food supplies in Somalia. And in our beloved sport of swimming, one of our most experienced Olympic coaches becomes head coach in the person of Mark Schubert. We don't have enough time tonight to summarize Coach Schubert's career with the amazing compilation of statistics that would lead me to call him the most successful swimming coach in history. But I believe a large number of the historical figures in our sport, many in this room and at this table, would support that notion. Mark is a five-time ASCA Coach of the Year and has remar had remarkable achievements in both club and collegiate swimming and has been our most prominent international coach in the past three decades. At his first World Championships and first Olympic appearance as USA National Team Director and Head Coach, he's led the Team USA to its most dominant performance in the history of our sport. Selected to the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1997, the fourth member of the Olympic Head Coaches present to win the USA Swimming Award in 2005. Please welcome our National Team Head Coach and General Manager, Olympic Head Coach Mark Schubert. Well, first of all, um, it's a great honor to be here tonight and a great honor to be sitting up here with uh, people that are my heroes. Um, I want to thank some people uh, because I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, one of them is Eddie Reese, who I learned so much from in the four years that I coached at the University of Texas. And I was privileged to be his roommate at two Olympic Games. And we've been through a lot <laughs> at Olympic Games together. Uh, both good and challenging, uh, but that's what coaching is all about. Uh, second is Coach Peter Dalen, who's uh, been my idol for a long time and uh, was always kind enough when I was a young coach to allow me to come up and watch his practices. And I've, 
learned a lot from him and he continued to be my mentor when I coached at USC and I always appreciated that very much. And third is Don Gambrell. Uh, Don was the head coach, as you know, of the 84 Olympic team and that was uh, my first Olympic Games on deck and uh, just being able to watch Don, watch how he handled people, watch how he handled coaches and I think he referred a little bit to uh, it's not just the challenge of handling the personalities of the different swimmers, which is a challenge, but it's also a challenge of handling the personalities of the different coaches. Uh, and if you think swimmers have egos, believe me, all of those great coaches have some pretty great egos as well, and, and Don was just a master at that. Uh, Thinking about uh, highlights of my uh, first Olympic Games as head coach, uh, we had a great uh, challenge from Germany and a great challenge from China at that meet. Uh, I think uh, one of my favorite races was uh, watching Nicole Hazlett, who was a, a veteran, uh, swim against uh, Francisca Van Omsnick, who later became a world record holder and was a great, great swimmer. But uh, Nicole just handled her like a pro. Uh, Francisca swam over next to the lane line. Nicole was right there with her at the 50, at the 100. At the 150, she kind of came up. She worked the turn, and then she came back on the other side of the lane line and won the 200 free. And, and we, at that point, hadn't won a whole lot of events. So that was a real sweet one. The uh, second one was uh, I got an opportunity to coach uh, Janet Evans a little bit later in her career, and of course, at the 88 Olympic Games, she won three gold medals. And I think she learned uh, in Barcelona at the 92 Games that uh, three gold medals uh, when you're young isn't always quite as easy as winning gold medals when you're older. She lost a very close race to uh, Dagna Hasse uh, from Germany in the 400 free by uh, less than two tenths of a second and it crushed her. It was tough on her. But she really came back uh, like a champion and won the 800 freestyle relay or 800 freestyle by over five seconds. And uh, I think learned a lot about herself and learned a lot about her appreciation for Olympic gold medals. Probably the swimmer that I admired the most uh, on the women's team in 1992 was Summer Sanders, a Richard Quick swimmer. Uh, she fought valiantly in, in both the 400 IM and the 200 IM, placing third, placing second, and we wondered if she would ever win a gold medal. You know, at, at the time she was probably, her and uh, Jenny Thompson were probably the two dominant swimmers uh, in the United States at that time. And she came back in the 200, Butterfly to, to beat Zhang Wang. Uh, it was a, a classic race. Uh, Summer kind of led from the get-go, and uh, that was a, a great joy on our team to see uh, Summer accomplish that. And I remember uh, it was interesting because at the meet, uh, George Steinbrenner came and sat with the team the whole time. That was interesting. He was the vice president of, of the USOC, and we were hoping that he wasn't going to handle the USOC like he handled the New York Yankees, otherwise I probably wouldn't have lasted through the first or the second day of the meet. Uh, and then the other person that came and sat with us the whole time was uh, uh, Evander Holerfield. And he was just the most down-to-earth guy and, and sat right in the stands with the athletes, did the cheers, everything else. He, he was wonderful. And, and those are moments that we remember. I'm sure those of you that saw the 2008 games and saw the NBA players uh, sit with the team uh, at the Olympic Games. That, that is such a thrill to see that they are swimming fans and that they look at uh, our great swimmers very much like we look at them. Um, I, I guess the, the last thing I want to tell you was uh, just kind of share with you my scariest moment at the Olympic Games. And uh, this really didn't have to do with the race, although the race ended up well. Uh, I was the head men's coach in 2000 in Sydney. And the first day uh, we had a, 
what was a pretty major setback, we lost uh, the last individual event, which was the men's foreigner freestyle relay to Australia. That was the first time that we'd ever lost that event. Um, there were two young men that were sitting back in the village, Tom Dolan and Eric Vent, and they looked at, at each other and they vowed, since they were the first two swimmers to swim the following day, that they would turn things around for the men's team and they would get one too. Well, Tom Dolan was a pretty experienced swimmer. That was a, a pretty easy vow for him, but for Eric Vent, uh, Eric was young. He had just made his first Olympic team. He just finished his first year of college. Uh, and he, he's a pretty cocky guy. You know, he, he'll make statements. Uh, then he has to live up with them. Uh, he's a very hard worker, uh, probably the hardest worker that I've ever had the privilege of coaching. But outside of the pool, his organizational skills, uh, when he was in college, uh, were a little bit lacking. And so we're getting ready. We make our plan to go over to the pool. Um, the second night of the Olympics, it's the 400 individual medley. We're going to leave uh, the village two hours ahead of time, uh, warm up um, about an hour and 15 minutes ahead of time, be able to get out of the water and, and be ready a good 30 minutes ahead of time, get your rub down, go to the, the ready room. So I'm on the bus and I'm looking around and Eric's not on the bus. And I'm going, okay, well, he'll, he'll catch the second bus. I'm, I'm not going to get too worried. That's probably not too unlike him. And I get over to the pool and I make a, a phone call to uh, Everett Uchiyama, who is uh, helping us with the national team and helping us with logistics in the village. And he said, Mark, I, I have some bad news for you. He said, Eric left to go meet the bus that was supposed to leave two hours before the finals, but he left his pass locked in his room in the village. So I said, okay, what are we gonna do about that? He goes, well, here's the problem. First of all, we have to get him back in the village without a pass which is nearly impossible. Secondly, then we have to get him back into his room because his, the key to his room is clipped on his pass. <laughs> and thirdly, and not the least most important, we have to get him back in time for his race to get him warmed up. So I'm, I'm sitting there as calmly as I can sit there trying to really act calm. I'm going, okay, I really don't have any control over what's happening in the village but I do have control over what's gonna happen here when he comes back. And uh, they called the police. The police got him into the village. They called the USOC. The USOC got him into his room. Uh, he got on the bus and he got to the pool. It was 30 minutes before his race. And all I said to him was, did you bring me a second pair of underwear? And he laughed. He said, don't worry, coach. I got it. Uh, <laughs> dove in, warmed up, was in the ready room, missed his rub down, but uh, Tom Dolan got first and Eric Vent got second. So, uh, you know, we, we think we, we play a, 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 big, uh, a big part in all of this, but a lot of times it's fate, um, and a lot of times it's just these athletes are, are pretty darn good. Uh, I want to thank all of you that do such a great job year in and year out developing our athletes. Um, we sit up here as head Olympic coaches in most cases because we've been blessed to coach great athletes and they've made us look real good. But as head Olympic coaches, it's all the coaches that are sitting out there that develop those athletes. You know, we get the, the responsibility and uh, the fun of handling the personalities when they get to the meet. But in most cases, you've made our job very easy. And I'd like to finish by saying that probably the biggest privilege that I ever have uh, when I go to an Olympic Games is being able to stand the night before uh, in front of the Olympic team and hold up the American cap with the flag and the name of the swimmer and remind them how many people have worked so hard for so many years to get the privilege of wearing that cap and what kind of a responsibility that is and how privileged they are, but 
how it is a responsibility to conduct themselves like a true champion, win or lose, and to represent the United States and re represent the American people well and make everybody at home proud of us. That is such an honor, and you all do such a good job of teaching that to your athletes. Keep it up. I'm proud of all of you. Thank you. The, the most important thing in a team atmosphere, any team, especially as they get older, is to work at taking care of each other. And the team in 2004 set a standard that the 2008 team did equal, but 2004, they had to do it with no real past experience. In 2004, the North, North Atlantic Treaty Organization admitted seven nations from the former Soviet republics. Janet Jackson and, Janet and Justin Timberlake are involved in an incident that makes Wardrobe malfunction part of our popular lexicon. Scientists in South Korea announced they've cloned three human beings. And the one I love the best, the most distant object in our solar system, is identified as a planetoid named Sedna, the largest item identified since Pluto in 1930. FINA immediately offers financial assistance to its swimming federation in order to buy a few more votes in the FINA Congress. <laughs> in our beloved sport of swimming, Coach Eddie Reese undertakes his second tour of duty as head Olympic coach. Head coach at the University of Texas since 1978, he's coached a very large boatload of USA Olympic swimmers since then, including in recent years, three world record holders in three different strokes, and the athletes Ian Crocker, Aaron Pearsall, Brendan Hansen. He's an eight-time NC2A Coach of the Year, four-time ASCA Coach of the Year. Coach Reese has co-developed 41 individual NCAA champions, 26 Olympians who've won 29 gold medals. One of the most popular coaches, co coaches clinic speakers in history, Coach Reese has always given generously of his time to help our profession and our sport in addition to coaching his teams and his own athletes. Selected to the International Swimming Hall of Fame in the year 2002, please welcome Head Olympic Coach Ed Reese. <laughs> Who's Justin Timberlake? <laughs> hey, look, this is a this is a phenomenal night for me just to be up here with these guys. I remember. Jack Nelson, when he was a swimmer on the Olympic team, back then he had the greatest fly kick. His feet were pressed together so hard it looked like he, somebody had used staples to get them together to stay together. And Don Gambrell, I kept Don Gambrell for com from coming to meetings like this because if we'd have been in this meeting, I'd have grabbed him at the door stuck him in a corner, and asked my thousand questions a day to him. Don has been my mentor through the whole thing. He has answered every question that I've asked. And I've learned now, not all the answers were right, but <laughs> I swam in a nationals in the, I don't know, I keep saying it's 57, it may have been 55, in Daytona Beach, Florida, when Stan Tinkham's beautiful women's swimming team was there. And at the age of 14 or 15, I knew what beautiful women were. Those were the ones with bumps. <laughs> but now, I didn't know he was that young. I know now why he had such a good-looking team. Jack Bowerly. Uh, friend in so many ways. He takes care of me in a lot of ways. Um, when you don't get to hunt or fish much, you have to hear from somebody that does. <laughs> and he does. Peter Dalen, I was at an NCAA's one year and he had a guy that was a uh, triple winner from the previous year named Frank Heckel. Our kind of swimmer, 6'5", 190, 30-inch, 28-inch waist, 
perfect swimming prototype. The individual medley, which Frank had won the year before, he didn't final. That was back when it was six and six, the NCAAs. And I was lucky enough to be standing next to Peter when Peter said, Frank, you can let this continue or you can stop it and get back on the horse, which Frank did. And Mark Schubert, who I learned more from him than he did from me, and since I'm speaking last, you have to believe that. <laughs> but he worked at Texas for a number of years and at that time, I learned what real hard work was and what it could do. I went to the women's NCAAs in, NCAA, in Indianapolis one year. Mark, Mark was coaching the team. I sat in the stand in the prelims, <clears throat> watched the prelims, and came down afterwards. And I told Mark, I said, you're going to win the meet. Well, he was 90 points down the first day. But I knew that was coming. Those were third events for his swimmers. Even the second day and won by 90 the last day. So I've got a good history with all these guys. And to coach Olympic teams, uh, be part of that equation has been incredible. In 1992, we had a team with Matt Biondi and Tom Jager, uh, the forerunners of pretty much the way we do it now. And they were, I was picked as head coach so that I could handle them. And they were, they put whatever feelings they, they had a side and took care of the team. But there was a lot of talk on the team because 1988, Matt Biondi had, had come second in the 100 butterfly because he made a choice to kick in instead of taking another stroke. And Anthony Nesty won the event. And he went by Matt in the last his last two strokes and Matt's reach. And the team had, people, individuals had talked about this. And first team meeting, we're sitting in somebody's room, 22 or 23 guys, and they wanted the meeting. I sat in the corner and shut up. And it was an incredible meeting. And Matt stood up and talked about that event. And he had put it behind him. But until that time, no, none of the rest of us had gotten over it for him. And he just took it off our backs so we could talk about it, forget it, because he had moved on as all great champions will. And <clears throat> another neat Olympic experience, I'm not going to make it. You're going to make it. <laughs> Try it again. Uh, Jack, my left ear is totally deaf. <laughs> but I can still hear him. Um, this past Olympics, we had a good relay, and had I put money on the race, because I'm a very logical person, I'd have taken it off at the 385 and put it on us, but I would have never told anybody that way, and that was the logic side. And Jason Lezak and I had talked a bit, and his words are, nobody, <laughs> nobody swims relays like the U.S. And we set up our order knowing what the French were going to do. We knew what their best relay was. 
and was with Fred on the end, not, not Alain. And we set up for that relay at the last moment, which is almost an hour before the finals start. You have to have your relay cards and there are no last minute deals. They changed that relay. And that really didn't change a whole lot. And they, they made a couple mistakes is all. And we, we did what we like to do. We like to win the close ones. And that's a credit to everybody that has coached an Olympic team and how you prepare your swimmers. I definitely echo Mark's comments about preparation. You guys do most of the work. We go to the Olympics, we get our $10 a day and all we can eat and try to get them in the right place and get them headed in the right direction. But every once in a while, I worry about their focus at a time like that. But it comes from me, it doesn't come from them. They do not get lost. I remember a guy named Brad Bridgewater in 1996 swam the last event. He'd have nothing else to swim in the meet. And he kept it together, won the 200 back. And so that people that make this Olympic team are special. People that get them to do the workouts are special too. Thanks for your help. Thanks for the night. It was an absolute privilege. And uh, it's a privilege to be around all, all the buddies and, you know, uh, men's staff, women's staff. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it brings you together. Uh, there's certainly a bond that's forged there because uh, just what you go through, because it is a little bit of a war. It's, a, it's an emotional battlefield in the sense. There are a lot of ups, a lot of downs, and when you go through that with someone, it's no, uh, you know, you, it just brings you closer, and it's, uh, but it's being remembered, just, just doing the best job. Most of you remember 2008. <laughs> it was pretty much all bad news, and I couldn't find anything funny to say about it except all you Republicans ready? Sarah Palin. <laughs> and Jack Barrowley became the latest member of this wonderfully exclusive club of head Olympic coaches for the USA Olympic team. Coach Mark Schubert called Jack Barrowley the consummate team coach in naming him to head the USA women's team in Beijing. What a great comment when you come in as the newest head Olympic coach. Coach, coach Barrowley's Georgia teams have won four NC2A titles. He's been chosen SEC Coach of the Year 13 times. He stands third on the all-time dual meet win list with 415 behind only Frank Comfort from North Carolina with 578 and a gentleman by the name of Bob Kippeth from Yale a few years ago with 528. Jack is the, activist, the winningest active coach in the NC2A. One of the things he's most proud of is the fact that he's had three NCAA Women of the Year, Lisa Cool, Christy Cowell, and Kim Black, all having been Georgia Bulldogs. Georgia is the only university in the country to have produced more than one, and Jack has coached all three. I'd have to tell you that it's impossible to introduce Jack Bowerly without commenting on the fact that his career at Georgia is a model of how to be a contributor to your university and to your community. In every way, Coach Bowerly is integral to the University of Georgia and to the community of Athens, Georgia. He epitomizes the concept of bloom where you are planted. Now the last couple of things we need to say about Jack is that his coach is here tonight, Coach Don Sonia. Coach Sonia, where are you? There, where are, there we go, there we go. Don, would you stand up please? Thank you very much for being here. And, and Don tells me that Jack is the greatest get out swimmer of all time. Now, he was only the seventh or eighth best guy on his team, but on Saturday morning, when Coach Sony wanted to go do something else and wanted to let everybody out of practice a little bit early, he always called on Jack, because Jack always came through with those best times on Saturday morning. Jack says that's because he wanted to get to the Jersey Shore and go surf. Now, we have one other thing. If you'll direct your, your attention to the screen for one second, this is the last known picture of head Olympic coach Jack Bowerly with hair. Thanks, John.
What an honor it is to be in front of you, and uh, thanks, John, and thanks for putting everything on for all of us, too. It's a, a labor of love, but, uh, you know, as we look out, and first of all, uh, I want to thank Mark uh, for having faith in me and giving me an opportunity of a lifetime to coach the best team in the world. And it is uh, an absolute experience to be over there, and it's, uh, I'm not going to document everything. Everything's been documented a little bit better than 2008 than it was coaching probably 1956. But uh, so everyone, you know, Miss Sony, Miss Coughlin, Miss Dara, we had a lot of great swims and a lot of great performances. And uh, it was just an amazing experience. We had a 15 year old and a 42 year old. That was easy. And uh, <laughs> so, but. Uh, at any rate, uh, I look on the table, I look at Jack, who I admired so deeply, you know, coming up as a young coach, he was always the power of positive thinking. And, uh, you know, Jack, and plus I like Jack because he was about my size. And, <laughs> and, uh, and Don, uh, we were competitors when I first started out, and he actually uh, led me to some real good decisions when I was trying to make decisions on national teams. Uh, and even though we were competitors, he was always helpful. Plus, we had a heck of a fishing trip up in Alaska. And uh, nonetheless, uh, I certainly want to thank Mark, and I already did for what he has done for me. The silliest moment I ever felt when I was uh, bestowed upon, I guess, uh, the coach of the World Championship in 2003, and I had to ask Mark to be my assistant coach. And I apologize to you five times before I asked you. I felt so silly. And then Peter, who's been a, a great, great diplomat for the United States swimming all, I mean, there's no one like Peter. Um, he's the same as he was 20 years ago. And, and, and uh, if you want to hear something about swimming, he'll tell you. And if you don't, he'll tell you. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and then we get to Eddie. And uh, I can't say enough about Ed. I mean, he's, uh, we do hunt together. We, we only swim each other in the wintertime when it's duck season in Texas and when it's quail season in Georgia. And we have this in perspective. But you know, my first, uh, my first Olympic experience as an assistant in 2000, uh, they came up to me and said, how would you like to room with Eddie Reese? I said, jeez, what an honor. And, I said, and uh, I said, that would be great. And I just had no idea that no one else would. <laughs> <laughs> So, anyhow, when Eddie's not talking, he's snoring. And uh, so I had an unusual training uh, camp experience. I didn't get much sleep, and I th thought I could sleep through everything, but Eddie, you challenged it, and uh, slept, uh, you know, about two and a half, three weeks with a pillow over my head. But uh, we've had a great time, and in 2008, I uh, wouldn't have made it without him, and certainly uh, Mark as a mentor, and uh, we had a lot of... Pretty dramatical things go, uh, dramatic things go, not, a, not awry, but certainly came up. And we handled them and, uh, because of the experience of Mark and Eddie at, and living with Eddie over there. And I did it again. I mean, it's unbelievable, but I did it again. He was my second best roommate I've ever had, though, I will say that. My best roommate is Francis. And uh, <laughs> sorry, Ed. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, and she's put up with a lot of these trips that we've gone away for for a long time. And, uh, but hey, I just want to say thanks. This is about people. It's about, uh, it's about the athletes first and foremost, making them as good as they possibly can be. Uh, to have Don Sonia here, my first coach, uh, that did things with us that people do today that we have real fancy names for. On Saturdays, we stood up and did lactate work. We did eight, we do six 400s on a 10 minute rest and you darn well better be good. Uh, Don used to back me up on a locker occasionally because he used to box and he scared me to death. And uh, as a young boy, and I can't thank him enough because there was no way I'd be standing in front of you without Don because as a young boy, I'd like basketball, football and baseball a little bit better than swimming. But he was one entertaining guy. And it brought me back to the pool day after day. And it was because of him I just kept swimming and swimming. He was fun as heck. And uh, Coach uh, Dick Schulberg is here. He taught me about international swimming. I, I worked with Dick in 79 and 80, two best summers of my life. And uh, he, uh, he changed my life and changed uh, the way I approached swimming. And I'll never forget, I mean, you know, I don't know if you've ever, I've had some great roommate stories. But uh, my room with Dick, Dick doesn't sleep. 
at an international uh, qualifying meet. We're at World Championship Trials, my first time at a big meet. I think 79, it's 3.30. Jackie, wake up. You gotta go take it, we're taking a walk. I can't sleep. So this went on, it's an eight day meet, eight nights, I'm up. You know? So I'm just sort of laying in bed wondering when I'm gonna wake up. I got no sleep. But uh, unbelievable, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about John Urbanchek, who all the, a lot of coaches standing uh, or sitting up here tonight are better coaches because of John. And we, we just beg, bar, and steal, and he's one of the best coaches in the world. And uh, so I just want to say what a privilege, privilege it is to be standing in front of you. It's, it's a fun night, and um, what a great thing to, uh, to be part of United States swimming. It's the best swimming country in the world. And uh, we have a lot to live up to, and, we had, and the challenges are great. We got some more coming our way. But, uh, you know, the people part makes everything the best, and this has been a, an unbelievable run, and I can't wait for it to continue. And I just want to say thanks to John for doing everything tonight, number one, and thanks to all the coaches up here for, uh, you know, showing the way, because as a young coach, uh, these are the guys I had to rely on. They're absolutely tremendous. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> As you can imagine, there's always one coach who wants to know how many minutes, how did we do, how fast was it? Okay, well, Jack, we did good. We did really good. You did really well, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you of something, and most of you have heard this before. Coach Chuck Warner of Rutgers has a dream that I hope we all share. Everybody in this room, everybody around the United States, all 20,000 coaches, male, female, black, white, every other color we have. None of that matters. We are all American coaches. And Chuck's dream is that every coach in this country will consider themselves part of the American swimming team. You've heard many of these coaches tonight say thank you to all of you and thank you to everyone who's not here tonight for helping make this the greatest sports team on the planet. Gentlemen, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We appreciate your being here, Olympic coaches. We hope we'll see you back real soon with a new member of the club. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you.